There's values-based communities and there's greed-based communities that are emerging. It's okay that both emerge, right? You need them for the ecosystem. Um, but if you want to be around for a very long period of time, you want to make sure that you establish your community as a values-based community. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm Matt Medved, um, co-founder and CEO of NFT Now. I uh, just wanted to welcome everyone uh, to our monthly series, NFT Now Presents. We have a great panel here today. Uh, my co-founder, Sam Heisel, uh, and I will be uh, moderating. And our esteemed guests are Keith Grossman, president of Time, and Olive Allen, uh, crypto artist and uh, pioneering artist in the space. And timepiece artist. That's right. Uh, why don't we kick things off? It has been such a wild ride, um, you know, since the boom in mainstream attention in NFTs. So we went from 2020 to 2021. Now we're in 2022. This space moves so quickly. I always say weeks are months, months are years in the NFT space. What is exciting you right now about the current state of NFTs? Oh, wow. That, that's a very profound question. I mean, um, a lot of things, a lot of things are changing. Everything changing every single day. Um, the new industries are emerging within the space. Um, digital fashion, metaverse, world, world building, gaming. There is so much going on. Even though, um, hypothetically, it's a bear market, but that's the best time, in my opinion. That's where you have... Um, really have time to step back and reflect and really, really like a hey, time to build in new things, to develop in new branches within the industry. And that's an exciting moment. I think this is my favorite time, like the high pulling down because it's been an intense year. NFTs took off and it's been nonstop. Like I really had no time to like sit and think really. Um, so I'll take it, I, I mean, this is the best space on the planet for insomniac workaholics, right? <laughs> and, um, uh, sorry, oh, sorry, I'll go. This is the, I'm just loud to begin with, right? So this is the best space for, for, for people like me. Like, and I'm just a workaholic and I'm an insomniac and I always love sort of seeing what's new and, and what's coming. And, you know, I think on the creative front, what I love about the space is there's really no filter between um, a creator and a potential collector. And while we were talking about this from the relationship that you can have earlier, Francesca and I were talking about it with her upcoming drop, um, what I really mean is, is that there's no reason why something that's super creative can't find an audience anywhere. And like, take you, for instance, with Food Mask you, right? Like, no, 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 but like, like you smile, but if you haven't seen his work, it's very unique and you attract an audience because there's no one telling you that you can't do what you're doing. But the thing that, that excites me the most is um, last year in like March, end of March, I announced that time was gonna enter into this space and I was greeted with um, a steady um, array of are you crazy? Um, or like what is wrong with you? Or um, is this a joke? And to which I said no. You know, I think that there's a real shift taking place in consumer behavior. And I think that this is a huge tectonic move over a 20 year period from online readership or rentership to ownership. I think that privacy is gonna to shift towards the consumer, which is what Web3 is enabling. And all, oh, sorry, I have to go higher, sorry. I thought I was just loud enough, right? And, uh, and what excites me now is a lot, like nobody asks me if I'm crazy anymore. As a matter of fact, the exact opposite happens. Like people are asking, can I explain to them what's happening in Web3? Can I explain to them why it matters? Like to give you an idea how important that is, right? Like these are not small institutions that are saying like, let me understand what this shift is. These are places like Bank of America's Institutional Trading Desk. These are places like the World Economic Forum in Davos. These are places like, um, like Lake Nona Impact Forum. But like the fact that people are beginning to take this very seriously. And this is how real transitions take place. To me, excites me because we're gonna see over time just how powerful this moment in this past year has been. Yeah, 1000%. And just to build on that too, I mean, all the, the traction we've seen to date has been in a very challenging user experience for the end user. So I, I think as people are starting to come around, we have to also take into consideration that like, we're still just very much at the tip of the iceberg. Um, I, I think 
the mainstream perception of NFTs are starting to look beyond the headline and rather read deeper into some of the, the life-changing stories and how this is really redefining how creators can create and share in values with their community. So it's a, it's a really fun and exciting time. Before we jump into some kind of emerging use cases that everybody's excited about, I'd like to just see by a show of hands who in here actually has an NFT and has purchased an NFT. Amazing. All right, wait, so wait, wait. <laughs> who is not? Get out. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing. So I, I think in, in that vein, though, what to you on the panel, we'll start with you, Olive, like are some of the, the emerging use cases or validated use cases that you've seen that you really do think will help foster this mainstream adoption in the space? Um, right, there are so many use cases, really everything digital could be NFT essentially. It's just underlying technology that um, will advance a lot of industries and make them more um, Web3 native, like more digital friendly. I mean, as I said before, digital fashion, world, gaming, um, ticketing, um, art in some ways, um, everything you can imagine, even, even like great journalism, publishing. Right? So like, yeah, I see with, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the, the two journalists. Yeah, yeah. Right <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. I mean, everything can benefit. It's a new world um, for the new type of heroes, right? For the sake, I mean, either you get in or not. The technology is, go is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. It's revolutionizing um, the way we see value and assign it. Um, now, suddenly, uh, digital things um, as valuable as tangible ones. Right, that's uh, just a natural evolution as well as cryptocurrencies. It's evolution of money, NFTs is evolution, everything digital. Digital content, digital, um, you name it. So everything, in the future, everything will be NFT, then we won't even think about it twice. Which is pretty exciting. I knew it was going to happen. I, Darn, I was right, hey. <laughs> Yay. I admire your modesty. <laughs> no, is I? I'm joking, Olive and I have known each other for a while. Um, and, and she's right, I mean, we are in the earliest stage where we are talking about the technology still, right? We are not talking about the experience. And if you think about it, right, with computing, um, you know, there was this point where people would be like, oh, like I have a 486, I have a Pentium, I have eight megabytes of RAM, I have 16 megabytes of RAM, there was Prodigy, there was CompuServe, then there was American Online, right? Um, it wasn't until Steve Jobs lifted up, you know, the iPod and said a thousand songs in your pocket that people all of a sudden realized it wasn't about the technology, it was about what the experience was that the consumer can have. We're not there yet, right? We're still in the spec stage. Um, when we're there yet, we won't even say the word NFT, right? Or the term NFT, because it's not a word, right? Like, um, uh, we'll, we'll move towards talking about what the experience is. And I think that you actually make an amazing point, which is ultimately that the NFT is a conduit. It's a technology, right? And any industry that um, lacks transparency is going to ultimately be disrupted. And you know, like when I say Web3, I mean crypto and DeFi and NFTs and the metaverse. And I think what we're gonna see over the coming years is the convergence of all of those different areas in traditional industries and uh, places that you know have middlemen or friction between the consumer and the end experience are gonna be massively disrupted. And so I think as you think about career choice and you think about you know, where you want to see opportunity, you should think about um, what is an industry that can be disrupted if you can validate ownership online. And that's what this technology is really doing and um, revolutionizing. Yeah, I love that, I love that. Uh, ooh. That was dramatic. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, as someone who grew up, you know, in the creative writing space, like I am very excited about literary NFTs as an emerging use case. I believe that um, as as this progresses, um, NFTs are going to totally revolutionize poetry uh, and be, uh, enable poets to uh, create collector bases, similar to how um, you know it has enabled that for uh, digital artists. I think that uh, if you think about it in terms of writing, like poetry is can can evoke uh, a really visceral feeling in 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 a reader in a similar way in a short amount of time in, in a similar way to a piece of art and I think we're we're already starting to see some really exciting things with poetry on the blockchain but we've just scratched the surface and um, you know one other thing that I wanted to say too is that like I totally agree with Keith on how early we are and one thing one way I can tell we're early is that 
we're, there are so many different disciplines that we're starting to see emerge. Uh, obviously, we've seen the market boom driven by uh, digital collectibles. We saw what happened with digital art. We've seen photography and music and, and, and video and, and all these interesting areas start to really pop up, membership passes, et cetera. But we're still so early that we're kind of lumping them all together and, and judging them by, by the same standards when there are very different creative and consumer priorities at play. I mean, you would never expect like to buy a painting and for that painting to get you into a club, and in the real world, and, and kind of though, huh? <laughs> and you would never expect like necessarily like your membership pass to a place like Noya House to necessarily be designed by a fine artist. But one of the beautiful things about uh, NFTs is that it blends these mediums together. Um, but I am I am excited for for us to kind of to let these markets develop and be able to understand that each of these different spaces and each of these different use cases have their own creative and consumer priorities at play, and no, no one's right or wrong, and you know, there's, there's different ways to do different things. Um, and in that vein, I'd love to talk a little bit about misconceptions in the NFT space, because um, each of you um, have been pioneers in the space in your respective fields. Olive, you've been making uh, art on, on the blockchain since 2018, long before uh, it was getting the attention that it's getting or that or it had the market that it has. And Keith, you led, um, you know, this Web3 revolution at a legacy, at a legacy brand, a legacy publication like Time. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts and your perspectives on like what the biggest misconceptions around NFTs are and how you've seen that shift potentially uh, during, during that period. Oh, wow. I mean, it, it's been a long ride, definitely. So many things have changed. I remember our early 2018 when I just heard about NFTs, so I was like, yeah, that really does make sense to me. Hey, I have a ton of skins. That's just like from Fortnite. Like, yeah, I cannot sell for <laughs> like, yeah, never really. Hey, it just makes sense. Digital is real. Yeah, why, why wouldn't we have uh, um, predetermined value and scarcity and it's all of those things? And I was like, hey, I got to get in. Like, I have to start a startup. Hey, that was like a millennial bug. And uh, funny enough, I started in the space as a founder, not as an artist, even though I was an artist in New York for quite a time. And I was like, hey, I need to go to Silicon Valley and I go need to, we need to go to Y Combinator and pitch everybody on this amazing things. And I, I was a very, very early. Whenever I was going in Silicon Valley, like respected VCs, they'd be like, oh, okay, cool. This show's real. Okay, cool. Thanks for coming by. Really, really a pleasure. Uh, but a little that we know, I mean, some of those VCs called me uh, back a year later and be like, oh, hey, I remember you were pitching me. Like, hey, you're still around? Like, Okay, cool. Um, but I feel like with every emerging technology, you have to um, be great with timing. Timing is everything, with NFTs, with any cryptocurrency, everything, markets. Um, you can't be too early. You have to be right on time, in a sense, with the mainstream adoption. Really, or you have to be consistent to a point of like being delusional, right? One or the other. But um, it's exciting. It's always been like four or five years and I see space is already maturing. I, I mean, I'm so surprised that time was so early. It's like, oh my God, like it, it's a bizarre, so visionary, especially I understand how the corporations work and like, right, it takes time to adopt literally anything. So I could, could have seen it like, wow, impressive. Um, so, I mean, yes, we're still early and interest kind of goes like in waves. So whatever market's high, everybody's interested. Where market's not, it's down. But like um, technology and progress in the world is still kind of evolving at a very, very slow pace, which is exciting to me. I mean, obviously. So I think that the biggest misperception that I faced was people thinking that this was a revolution of JPEGs and not that it was a revolution of, or an evolution of communities. And for me, I had this moment, um, and I think we all had this moment. It was 2020 and I was lonely. Like, I mean, I don't know, like this feels good, right? To, to see everyone. Um, to be here in person, to just be like next to you. The moment I met Olive, like I had known Olive only online, but I mean, you can attest, did I not jump up and I was like, oh my God, I follow you on Instagram. You're so talented, right? And it was at Christie's and, and there's something to be said about 
what we all realized during 2020, which was, um, wow, um, if in real life can be taken away from us and you know, uh, we could still have relationships online, um, maybe our communities don't have to be dictated by demographics or geographics, right? They could be dictated by psychographics, shared psychographics. And when I started to look at these communities forming, I started to see something really powerful, which was um, individuals coming together based on sort of accrued value systems or equal value systems. And that was really interesting to me because from a media perspective, um, you often talk about reach, right? Or impressions, um, you know, like everyone and their mother knows time, right? You might have a misperception of time. You might say to me, um, I grew up with time or my family had time or some people tell me that they learned English with time, right? Or they, you know, trusted this brand. Um, but that's an audience, right? And there's a huge difference between an audience and a community. An audience just shows up and engages with you once and then moves on and may come back. A community actually wants to build with you. And I had not seen a community in such strong force as, as, I, as I'm seeing now and as I've seen over the past you know, two years, um, since I was at Condé Nast and I ran Ars Technica. Even Wired didn't have a community. Ars Technica had a real community, and, and I always was enamored with that. Like, how could that scale to the masses? And so I think that the biggest misperception that people have is, um, is that it's about the image, which is on the surface, but it's not about sort of what's underneath the surface and then how valuable that, that is. And I remember when... I was asked in terms of like when we started to see that this was a real business for us to move into as, as time, I was asked by our owner, Mark Benioff, um, what's more important, um, uh, drops and monetization or community? And I said to him, oh, hands down, it's community because this is an evolution that if you don't have the community, you have no drops, right? And if you don't have the community standing for something, you have no drops, like nobody cares. If you're not known, if you don't have a value system, nobody cares. And so I think that that's a really important realization as to you know what people don't realize is taking place. Um, Farouk, to his credit, um, had a tweet that changed my perception um, over the summer. And it was a very simple equation. And I say it all the time. And because I say it all the time, I want to credit him. Because if I don't credit him, and since I'm being recorded and he sees this video, he's going to then yell at me or something and say, that was me. But he made this one little chart. And it said, in Web 2, the equation for success is brand finds a creator who then reaches an audience. And in Web 3, it's actually inverted. Community uplifts a creator. And then the brand's job is to uplift the creator further. And by doing that, the community validates the brand, right? Picture what the first equation is. Time hires Ian Bremmer to write an article, and that reaches you, and you read it, right? Think about what that second equation is. I am very fortunate that I'm, I'm paired with Olive, who happens to be part of the timepiece community of artists, right? Like, the community uplifted Olive, right, since 2018, have known her work. It's been in Sotheby's. It's been in Christie's. It's incredible. Um, the community has uplifted Olive. Time's job is to uplift her higher. And in return for uplifting Olive higher, then all of a sudden, sort of, the community validates the Time brand. Think about what Time Pieces is, ultimately. It's literally just the Time logo in the smallest center. Front and center is your work, right? And it's the name. Right? But then everything else, all the other magic, happens in the community, in the discord, in the conversations, in, the, in real life chats. And I think that that's the biggest misperception that people have. Yeah, no, absolutely. Sorry, I'm very long-winded tonight. Yeah, that's what you're here for, man. Okay. You're, you're, you're on a panel. Um, no, and, and just to build on that, too, I think it, it, it creates more economic viability around community and communities at a smaller scale. And I, I think that gets really exciting because it really actualizes a lot of the promise of not sure if you're familiar with Kevin Kelly's 1,000 True Fans, but really based on the, the premise that 
you don't need to be a superstar with millions of fans to earn a meaningful income. If you have a thousand true fans that are really picking up everything you put down, like you'll be able to support yourself in your creative pursuits. I, I think that's been tough within the current economic model. I, I think. Um, yeah. Can I just, because Kevin Kelly was one of the founders of Wired, and he made this comment to me, and I think that it's actually a really important point that I don't want to forget. Yeah. And Olive, I think you're the best to speak about it too, which is he said, no technology has been invented for good that can't also be used for bad, and vice versa. And if you look at the world that we're in, um, 10 years ago, Facebook was heralded, right? Today, I think it might be better to have a job at Altria, right? <laughs> like, and like, think about that. That's a huge shift. Like, this is a company that had to change its name, right? That's a big matzo ball. That's not small, right? Same strategy, just different name, right? But like, here we are, and we're early enough on that like we can actually have some impact and I'll have like to your credit, and this is why I just didn't want to forget this. It, like think about like all the stats that you have thrown out about female creators, right? And like this is a moment where I think it's really important that we think about the inclusivity of this ecosystem and how, and like you made the joke, like we're inclusive, right? In the beginning when, when the non-NFT, like I cannot believe we're even accepting non-NFTers, right? But like when the non-NFTers raise their hand, we're inclusive. I think that that's really important. And as this scales, we're gonna lose this moment. And so like the best we can do right now is push as much good into the system as we can. And Olive, I don't know if you wanna like talk about some of the stats, but like you throw out a lot of jarring stats quite a bit about female creators, the monetization of female work versus male work in the space, um, and- Real stats, yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, 5% of all the NFT sell amount to female um, artists. That's the real statistics. I mean, uh, tech doesn't change social structures, it really doesn't. It just uh, really amplifies them. Um, that's why we need to put the deliberate efforts towards uh, inclusivity. Right. If it's not deliberate, if it's just uh, what it is, it's society is not as evolved as it might seem. We're still like really like making baby steps towards better and more fair society. Hey, just like this past century, like a lot of changes happened. Like literally in, in my lifetime, I've seen gay marriage being legalized. This is like insane if you think about that. And like women's voting rights, like last century, like literally like baby steps. And a lot of uh, our subconscious mind is so, so not evolved in a sense, right? And like, we have to really make sure that we ourselves like making conscious evidence, telling ourselves, hey, hey, that's not right. Like, why am I buying like I'm, my main bros? Like, hey, hey, like, let me see what's out there. Let me see why like uh, this different person that doesn't look like me, like making this kind of work and like, what are they saying? What is it all about? Oh, that's what it is. Um, I think it's effort, it's definitely effort and we should put as much of it as possible to um, make it a norm, right? Like small changes, like effort in the beginning, but then it's a norm and that leads to a better society overall. Yeah, totally agree and do wanna build on that because I, I do think that historically creators across different domains um, there's been a lot of exploitation, appropriation. I think NFTs give more power to creators to actually share in the success of their influence. Um, so even though I love your, I mean, your, your point is spot on as far as that, like tech doesn't solve problems to some extent, unless we're like hyper intentional, it just continues to perpetuate them. But with that said, there is an undeniable opportunity to bring power back and, and create a more equitable model within this community. So tactically, for all of us, and we'll start with you, Olive, but like curious when it comes to, we know there's an opportunity to leverage and unleash the potential of the technology to drive more equitable future. Um, how do we do that? How do we do that? How, do, how, does, how does everybody in this community participate? I mean, how is everybody just really um, try to learn, like try to diversify your portfolio, right? So to say, hey, if you're collecting male artists, be like, okay, let me look at what else is out there. Just like really be curious, be curious and catch yourself when you're being racist or sexist. I know it's subco subconscious biases are real. Gender is a social construct. When we've been taught how to behave, how to present ourselves in the, in the world, if we were born with a specific gender, it's a real study, it's a real fact. It's mostly social construct. So, and things are changing for the past few years, but it's only recently 
right? And a lot of us who were born, like, I don't know, who don't belong to Gen Z generation, I still have, like, the old uh, model sort of, like, embedded in us. So just, like, really, really be conscious of your decisions, of your choices, and ask yourself, hey, why am I seeing why I like what I like? Do I really like it? All because I think, um, subconsciously think, male creators are more talented than women. You know, I catch yourself. I, I've been, I have those biases myself. I've been catching myself for, for quite a while, to be honest. I was like, holy fuck, did I really think that way? <laughs> How am I? So yeah, and that, that leads to like your personal evolution and uh, betterment of a society as a whole. I, I think that's priceless. I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take it from a slightly different angle, which is um, from the economic angle, right? Um, I don't know if Maya Drazen is here right now. Um, I know she was running a little late, but she's my partner uh, in launching timepieces. And she's been my partner for, she's like close to 20 plus years. Like we were at Wired together and ours together. And, and she was my first hire when I came over to time. And um, when we saw that NFTs allowed for a new economic model for creators, um, it was really important to Maya and I and to Barat Krish, who's our CTO, um, to apply the new model to uh, timepieces. And I don't know if you've ever, if you're Bob Dylan fans, you know, from a generation perspective, like I have to rationalize that I am what's considered an aging millennial, right? I'm at the latest stage that you could possibly be in the millennial um, cycle. But Bob Dylan has this quote, of if you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose, right? Um, the converse of it is is some of something's better than none of nothing, right? When you start to think about it. And when we started to enter into the space, you know, I had spent months and months and months listening to people like JN Silva, um, uh, you know, talk about, you know, the power of this technology. And um, when you think about in the analog world of publishing or even the digital web two world of it, like the way that a relationship is established is um, creator and vendor, right? And I think anyone who's a creator in this audience knows that model. Um, the way that we structured timepieces though was very different and it required a lot of like handholding internally and discussions internally because it changes the way that we as an organization have to think about um, economics over the lifetime of a relationship. And so with timepieces, we wanted to correct a few things. One is we wanted to build from the get-go philanthropy into everything we do, right? Like if you think about this movement, what's happening in Web3, it's more of a stakeholder capitalism movement than it is a Milton Friedman-esque 1972 return to the shareholder movement, right? This is about thinking about the greater good. And so the first 1% of primary and secondary sales always goes to charity, right? And that's in perpetuity. Then you get to the remaining 99%, and as Olive can attest, like we split it evenly with the artists, not just on the primary sale, but on the secondary sales forever. And let me tell you, it is a pain in the ass for any financial team to do this, right? And when we started, we had 38 artists as timepiece artists, and now we have 89. And once a quarter, because it's not automated yet by OpenSea or you know, the other platforms to come, once a quarter, you know, every timepiece artist gets a, an ETH transfer, right? And that's a really different relationship because now, like when I think about Olive and her career and everything that she's done, and like, we could talk at length about you know, her, her recent passport drop. Like, I have a vested interest to always make sure that she's successful beyond just liking you and, and getting along, right? But I, I do because she's part of the time family and she's rooting for me because she's part of the time family. And I think that that changes, that dynamic change is not just economical, but it actually makes sense for the survival and the, the sort of success of brands moving forward. Great, I think that's a great point, great points across the board. Um, I just want to touch on curation as well, um, briefly. You know, one of the things that, that drew me most to the NFT space was the way that it empowers creators to bypass gatekeepers. And, um, you know, we've seen that happen in the art world where 
major auction houses and, and the leading galleries went from deciding who gets to be seen and who gets to succeed to scrambling to capitalize on creators who are already doing that within, within a model that they can no longer control. And I, I come from the music industry and you know, similarly there, these hierarchies that have run these industries are largely white, male, and cisgender. And there's no surprise that the artists and creators that they tend to elevate look the same. And we have an opportunity now to rebuild or build a, a new paradigm, a new Web3 uh, that doesn't just rebuild the same entrenched inequities and hierarchies that have existed, but it's going to take people actually taking this beyond lip service, like buying art from diverse creators, supporting projects from diverse creators, and ensuring that we don't just create a new class of gatekeepers who look the same as the ones that have been running things for generations. So um, that's, that's one of the things that I'm most passionate about in, in the space. Can, can I, I know this is a very heady subject, but can I pause for one second? Because I made a pledge today on spaces. Yeah. So Dave Krugman, will you come on up here for a second? Yeah. So anyone who's in our spaces today knows, and Dave's an amazing photographer, that I said flat out that if he came tonight, I would wear a bandana for the rest of the show. <laughs> and, and I pledged it. And, you know, I personally think Dave looks amazing in the blue bandana. His picture on Instagram and on Twitter is the red bandana. But I'm sorry, I just need to pause to be bandanaed for a second, okay. if you don't mind. This is my dream come true. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> For those who don't know, Dave is an incredible uh, photographer, artist, and community builder in the space. And uh, we're all big fans of him, I think, as well. All right, here we go. Ready? Right. Gabrielle, will you, do I get, will you take a picture for yeah. Instagram for me? Right. I got you. Okay, awesome. Wait, you're going to make my ears look big, Dave. You know, like, you're going to go for the professional for photographer. Right? <laughs> How are we doing? Okay. Is, is this okay? Looks great. Does it? You, never oh, bandana before. You almost look as good as he does. I'm never looking. Where's my bandana? I think this is a good look for you. Is it? I don't even know what I look like, so <laughs> Well, you know, I, I think um, <laughs> this says it all. So, Keith, um, you know, prior prior to your bandana era, um, you uh, you launched the project Timepieces, um, which has been successful and also faced some challenges along the way. And so, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what were the lessons you learned from the process of launching an NFT project? Because I'm sure a lot of people in attendance here um, are curious about potentially launching their own in the future and could benefit from some of those insights. Sure, so, um, boy, Dave, this, this does give me a lot of confidence. Right? Yeah, it's great. No, um, I love this. So, look, I spent seven months studying this space and I was in clubhouse rooms and Twitter spaces, listening and absorbing, taking notes. Um, uh, I dissected communities like a great, I don't know if you know the story, but like two weeks before we launched Timepieces, I texted Gary V and I said to him, I just dissected all of V friends and I see exactly what you did. And, uh, and he wrote back to me, he goes, I love that, what did you learn? And uh, he's been incredible, incredibly supportive, I think, of everyone, and, and um, including myself. And, um, and I said I would always give him credit for, for being the inspiration in, in me thinking about community in this area. But um, what I learned most was no matter how much you study this space, no matter how, much, how, no matter how smart you are, um, there's nothing quite like actually doing it because um, you learn consumer behavior in a manner that you never would have expected. And the initial jump in, you find that up is actually down, left is actually right, right is actually wrong, wrong is actually right. And we made a lot of mistakes. And um, I actually 
today, in hindsight, very fortunate to be able to look back and, and you know, point to what we did to navigate through it. But I think like one of our biggest mistakes in the beginning was um, we didn't gate our mint. Um, we allowed it to be an open mint. And um, what people don't understand is, is up until September, like we had a very successful one of one business. Like we were selling one of ones on super rare for significant amounts of, of ETH. And my intention of timepieces was to democratize time to everyone and make it affordable, right? So 0.10 ETH was what the minting price was. But when you don't mint, right? So pick, when you don't gate or create an allow list, like think about this for one second, and this is important, right? A no allow list scenario is a democratic scenario. It sounds wonderful, right? Anyone can have access. The problem is, is that the bad players in this or the players who have more money in this can game the system to their advantage. And so here's some real stats. On you know the day that we did the uh, timepieces drop for the first one, um, we sold out 6,000 pieces in less than 40 seconds. Um, sounds amazing. Um, to any sort of economic perspective, awesome. Like, it was a great primary sale. Um, 6,000 pieces went to 1,230 wallets. Um, and we created gas wars. We broke open sea. Um, these are things that we're not proud of. And then it took three months, four months of showing up every day to the community before, like, I think we regained our footing. And during that time, we also made mistakes. We thought that the the best way out was, you know, reward everyone with an airdrop, right? And, you know, we put some really amazing art into the, you know, ecosystem for free that wasn't valued because of the way that we dropped it quickly to people to, to make amends. But I think that the lessons that I learned from this, moving back, was not just gate or not gate um, uh, or think about your tech stack or not think about your tech stack. It was... Um, what do you do when the community is really upset? And um, it was really bad. Like, I, I will tell you, I have launched a lot of things in my career. This is not my first time at the rodeo, right? Like, when I was at Wired, we digitized it for the first time, right? Like, we launched the tablet edition that Steve Jobs held up and said, this is how it should be done. At ours, we built the accelerator, which was a predictive algorithm, you know, um, that won a, a, an advertising invention award. At Bloomberg, we launched Quick Take, right? Like, I've launched a lot of things. And in each instance, when we messed up, it was like three or four or 10 people that were really upset. With this mess up in September, with the launch of timepieces when we rolled it out initially, it was like 30,000 people every day, nonstop, telling me, I was a fucking idiot, okay? And I have really thick skin, really thick skin, but there's a point where like you can't even open up your app without sort of being enveloped. And what I realized, and, and my role, right, is as, as the president of time is like, I have to stand there and I have to take the bullets for my team. Like, it's not like, hey, everyone, like, I'm just gonna sit back. Like, it's like, no, like it was coming at me. And I think that the lesson I learned was um, listen to the community, be present, don't hide, apologize, point out what you did wrong, and then show a gesture, give a gesture that shows that you have good intent, right? And, um, you know, like what we did ultimately that I think changed the sort of narrative and, and the momentum, which was going very negative to very positive, was I wrote a very long thread explaining our assumptions and where they went wrong. And at the end of the thread, we dropped to any person who minted or attempted to mint a minting pass, which was at my favorite cover of time, which was just my bad sense of humor, which I still had a little bit left at that moment, even though it was really bad, um, which was a cover of time which with a cat on it. You might have seen this cat minting pass. And I think that, and I did that for a few reasons. One is it's my favorite cover, it just always made me laugh. Two, nope, everyone likes cats. Three, 
Um, it was the Cool Cats that brought me into the ecosystem and really was the first one that held my hand through it. And so I did it in homage to them as a nod. Um, but at that moment, I figured that maybe that gesture would qua like calm down 50% of the ecosystem. Like at that moment, I watched this space go from what the fuck to, oh, you're not a brand, you're actually a human being. And I could see myself in that position and, and I got it. And then it was on, on us, right? As time, as the leadership, as Maya, as me, as Barad, as Lane, to just stand up and every week make some pledges. Like every week, and we've done this, every week since September, time halls in our Discord. What are we working on? Where are we going? What are we doing? And we stand in front of it. I do more time halls to our Discord community and to our timepiece community uh, than I do at time. Okay, just so you have an idea, like that's how much we spend in the community and we pledged that, right? Because ultimately, if this is a community-based moment or movement, um, brands have to become humanized in this moment, right? And personalities matter and the people matter and trust matters. And so, um, like I learned a lot at that moment about the community. I learned a lot at that moment about, you know, like, wow, like, I thought that opening up a democratic sort of um, process was the right process. It wasn't. Um, I learned a lot about uh, how people react to certain things. Um, the other thing I would say, and I'm sorry, just on a very long note, was um, there are two types of communities that emerge. And I think that this is really important. I apologize if you've heard me say this before, but um, there's values-based communities and there's greed-based communities that are emerging. and. Um, it's okay that both emerge, right? You need them for the ecosystem. Um, but if you want to be around for a very long period of time, you want to make sure that you establish your community as a values-based community. And you have to know what those values are. And you have to stand by those values, right? And so anyone who's part of timepieces hears me say it over and over and over again that our values are inclusivity, minus the people who don't own NFTs. Um, it, is, it is optimism. It is constructive feedback. It is what Bharat Krish, our CTO, calls a give first mentality. And we reinforce that over and over and over again. And while it's great to see the community grow, we also probably hold the record for the most people we've banned from Discord. We've banned over 5,000 people from our Discord. And those are people who have said to us, um, I love this artist, but why did you have to choose blank? And I'm like, we have a zero tolerance for this crap, right? You're out if you're you know, not in line with our values. And I think that that, as you start thinking about building your communities, is really important to rally around because a greed-based community is a short-term flipper community. And that's great too, but like, that's not, like short-term flippers will use their friends as exit liquidity, and that is not, how you want to build a long-term success in this ecosystem. Well said, well said. So in a second, we're going to jump to audience Q&A. So this is kind of one of the, the last questions we'll frame. But um, I'm curious, and we'll start with you, Olive. When it comes to, I mean, in the space here today, we have different creators, collectors, builders. Um, what do you think are some of either the, the key problems that we really need to address as we kind of go into this next wave of, of adoption? Either key problems or just general opportunities that people should be really be focused on? Um, well, problems are opportunities, right? I mean, of course, it's early days. Uh, as we said before, it was driven by greed a lot of times, right? A lot of uh, flippers are coming in this video. I mean, it's natural. Only tech is like that, like dot com, like bubble, boom, <laughs> bubble, uh, boom was like that. It, it, it's just inevitable. Right? I mean, you have to like, see through the noise. That's a lot of noise, a lot of action. Um, I guess like this space like lacks uh, a bit of structure. It's plus and minus. It, you know, it's just all over the place. You don't know what news to trust. What's what's uh, who is that guy uh, behind the avatar? Like ape avatar is like is even even real. Um, a lot of people like showing their bags. That's understandable. Um, right. I, I guess like better systems too, like verify and see through the noise um, should be built, and there will be. Uh, I'm pretty sure about that. Um, yeah, I, I don't really see that many problems, I guess, more opportunities. It is what it is. It's early days. It's expected that not everybody is a fair player. 
and everybody just has to do their own research, which is not a problem in itself, right? That's that something is encouraged to everyone at any time, right? I mean, I don't see that many problems, honestly. I mean, inclusivity, obviously, but I already said that before. I'm not going to beat myself. You guys got the point. Sorry, I feel like I haven't shut up tonight, so I was gonna, <laughs> I was just going to sit this one out. Um, I worry that people are over leveraged. Um, and I said this at NFT NYC, um, which was my first real moment in this ecosystem where I was able to look people in the eye and shake their hands. And I think that, I hope that um, uh, people realize that uh, this is a 20 year cycle. And I genuinely believe that the macro trend is correct. But against the backdrop of the macro trend, there's going to be some booms and there's going to be some busts. And uh, during the downtime, you're going to see a lot of amazing building taking place. Um, uh, I think that this uh, revolution and evolution is creating incredible new brands like NFT Now, which I've been no, I've not been shy about how much I love your brand, right? Um, uh, but at the same time, when I meet somebody who has their entire net worth in PFPs, um, I'll give you a few stats. 99% um, of you know, what's out there today will go to zero. Um, I genuinely believe that. Um, but here's a stat that like, y you could probably nod your head and say, I've heard that stat before a million times. But here's a stat that you may not have heard. By the way, there's Maya Drazen, who I was talking about. And there's Will Bond, our new VP of Operations uh, uh, at, at, at Web3 at Time. Uh, I'm so happy you both came. Thank you. Um, I'm wearing Dave Krugman's bandana. I don't know if you saw that. OK. Um, but here's a stat that you may not have heard. Uh, and when I was told it, it blew my mind. Uh, on OpenSea, there's 6.8 million collections across Ethereum and Polygon. And of those 6.8 million collections, only 15,000 of them have ever had a sale, which means that 90 9.8% of uh, collections on OpenSea um, don't even make money. So now picture this. Let's start with 99.8% of OpenSea's collections don't even make a sale. And of the 15,000 that make a sale, 99% will go to zero. I hope that I've scared the shit out of you. And the reason that I say this is for two reasons. One is, um, even with the ones that are successful, that's a larger percentage of success than exists in the previous structure. Um, and so you can't look at numbers. I could make numbers look any way I want them to look, just so you know, it's called Simpsons Paradox. But um, I highlight this on purpose because the second is, is when you buy a piece, buy a piece because you love it. Buy a piece because you love the art. Buy a piece because you believe in the artist. Buy a piece because you believe in where something's going. Buy a piece because you want to be part of the community. Do not buy a piece or put your entire net worth into this ecosystem with the expectation that it will continue to go up forever. It will not, right? There's a lot of great events that will take place over the coming months. But like, don't kid yourself. Prior to the ApeCoin coming out, where a lot of liquidity was entered into the ecosystem, 50% of the sales on OpenSea had diminished. 50% of Super Rare's volumes had fallen off. It does not mean that it will go down forever. But in these moments of extremism, like your emotions fly, right? When Ethereum corrected to 2,300, that was what Ethereum was in August of last year. And people were freaking out. Okay, when it hit 2300 in August of last year, people were celebrating. This is a very volatile space. And so the biggest misperception or the biggest caution I can give you is enter it cautiously, smartly. There will be people who will make a lot of money. Um, there will be people who will lose a lot of money. Do not do anything that puts you in a position where you could be exposed beyond your means. That would be my ask of anyone. It's a great point. It's a great point. Uh, real quick before we jump over to audience Q&A, I also want to touch on the importance of protecting newcomers to the space. Um, wallet security is no joke. 
you know, I went through the crypto learning curve back in 2013 when there were fewer guardrails. You couldn't even trust the platforms you were using to buy Bitcoin back then. Um, and I still had to go through the NFT learning curve in 2020. And a lot of people are going through both at the same time. And that's incredibly daunting. And uh, there are a ton of scammers out there who want to part you from you know, your precious digital assets. And they're getting increasingly sophisticated. Uh, and what I don't want to see happen is what we saw happen uh, in 2017 and 2018 with the ICO boom, where a lot of good people decided to get their, get their, their feet wet in crypto, got, tried to like, dip their, their toes in the water, and got burned. And a lot of them walked away, being like, I, that was a bad taste in their mouth. And like, I don't want to deal with that again. Uh, I think we all have a, a responsibility to protect newcomers to the space, education, um, and that's one of the reasons why we founded NFT Now. So um, thank you, everyone. We are going to turn it over to audience Q&A. Um, I believe we have, yep, we got the microphone there, so. If uh, somebody has a question, just raise your hand and they'll bring a mic. Not I, I know that guy. Hey guys, uh, I've been wondering this for a long time, Keith. Um, what sort of pushback did you experience being so early as you know a legacy institution uh, of such prestige? I imagine there was a lot of people internally that didn't want to take such a deep dive that you did. Um, you know, I, I think that you're really leading the charge here. I'm curious, did you have to swim upstream to get your ideas out onto the blockchain? I'm looking at Maya who is smiling at me. Can you come here for one second, please? Please, come on. I know you don't like the stage, but please, please. I mean, Maya Drazen, who, if you know, is Miss Maya D in our, um, in our um, Discord and in our community, is um, we've worked together for 22 years. The only, the only achievement in my career that I've ever done without Maya at my side was my time at Bloomberg. Um, and uh, she's my partner in crime on everything. And... Um, I mean, how, like, how do, how do we answer that question? Like, you, how, what was like, it, people thought we were nuts. <laughs> people still think we're nuts. People still think we're nuts, right? Like, um, I, I mean, I think that the only way I could get through this, you know, Will is still new, so he doesn't get the credit yet, but he's been amazing. Like, since he's joined, it's been three weeks. But um, we had a very, I was very fortunate uh, the three crazies that joined me very early on were Maya, Barat, who, um, you know, you have to keep in mind, Maya, uh, if you like the Webbies, Maya founded the Webbies. If you um, uh, like Wired Magazine, like Maya was the intern at Wired at one point, right? Like, uh, like you like literally were like stuffing like CD-ROMs into Wired issues back in the day. Like, um, uh, Maya's the most creative person I know. And so I was very lucky I had a partner that like trusted me and like we share crazy together, right? And you kind of need that. Um, I also, to be quite honest, was very surprised that our lawyer was so quick to um, jump in and, and um, say, okay, on the one of one sales, right? The time pieces took a little bit more, but like the one of one sales um, was accepted pretty quick. And our creative director, D.W. Pine, was very quick to to jump in. And what people didn't realize about Barat Krish was we hired a CTO who wasn't a media CTO, right? He was a technology CTO, and um, he had a former failed ICO. And his only ask of me was, like, I don't want to get back into crypto, <laughs> right? And, of course, we pulled him back in. And um, uh, and then we had Lane Little, who, you know, was on Maya's team, and she just loved it and, like, jumped into this thing, you know, full full steam, and um, I think I think there was like people didn't understand the gravity of like how big this could be in the beginning. They thought it was a joke. Um, so like the uh, first joke that I got was you know on the night of the first one of one drop, you know people were like, if you do more than five thousand bucks, like I'll buy you lunch was what I got from everyone internally, you know, and it did four hundred and forty thousand. Right, and that blew that blew all of our mind. Right, and um, and, and then we had a miss. Right, we learned something really important, which was you know we we implemented uh, cryptocurrencies for digital subscriptions on time, and we thought it would be bigger than it was. It's big, but it's not nearly as big. And what we learned was in Web two, if subscriptions lead, 
a conversation in Web3, subscriptions are sort of value to the NFT itself, right, which is perceived as value. Um, uh, and when the subscriptions thing didn't sort of take off, um, like, you know, like some people were like, I knew it, you were wrong, you're an idiot. And like, I didn't really care. I just continued on. I'd been told that tons of times. And um, I knew that we were going to use, and I feel confident saying that because I said it in the press on, Mar on March 22nd, I said I knew we would use the technology to figure out how to transform uh, the relationship that our, our reader had or our consumer had with our brand. But I mean, Maya, you know this, like, like we couldn't figure it out. It took us seven months of listening to Clubhouse, listening to you, Dave, listening to Jay and Silva, listening to Ryan, listening to everyone, like, you know, meeting people like you, Olive. Um, it took us a lot of time to understand, like, how to do this. And as I had mentioned, like, we, we still got the minting a little off, right? But the, the thesis was there. But Maya, what did I miss? Um, I just think you, you're going to have doubters. You're going to have naysayers. And... Um, but we didn't, we loved it, we didn't care, and the community was giving us love back, and, I, and, and we were learning and growing, and I think actually the bigger challenge is anyone who gets near Web3 loves it so much they never want to go back. Would you not agree, right? I, I mean, our joke sometimes is like, I can't believe we have to do Web2, right? And, like, and, and, it's, and it's just, it's so, I mean, it's, it's, it's as fun as the most fun I've had in my career, my professional career. And it's not just about building, like it's, it's just getting to know people and networking and, and understanding the people behind the art as we were talking about in the beginning, you know, Francesca and like, and, and seeing what works and getting feedback from the community, right? I mean, boy, like think about like, just even the advice that we've gotten from the community, right? Like, and you, you had to build out the whole mod structure, right? Like, what, what did you, that was crazy. It's crazy town. <laughs> it was... Well, I, I do think everything moves so much faster would be the other thing. And so like, while people doubt you uh, internally, everything, if you do it, everything's moving. And to Keith's point, like you just keep proving them wrong. And then there, there comes a point where there's nothing really that they can say because you're generating so much revenue in our, in our experience. And then the challenge is just getting the, the organization to keep up with you, right? Like, so we were getting our hands slapped by legal every day, pretty much. And so we just- We're recorded, so just oh. we be instituted, careful, please, huh? No, we instituted <laughs> a daily meeting and now we're good. So it's just like you have to you have to adjust the way peop other people work in your finance, legal, HR, to deal with it. If those of you are in, any of you are in big corporations, um, those things have to have to change. Amazing, thank you so much. Um, who's next? Hi, um, I just want to say thank you for the, the presentation so far. It was like very insightful and it was nice to hear everyone's opinion. Um, so my question is specifically around live stream NFTs and how do you guys see that maybe disrupting like pay-per-view, especially for creators within combat sports and things of sorts of that nature. And if you know any interesting projects in the space that we should look out for. Do you want to go first, Saul? I mean, I feel like NFT now, guys, no, we would know. I mean, hi, guys, you were in media. I mean. Well, I'll say this. I think that um, NFTs are going to disrupt, like, every discipline, and TV film is an area that, like, we have our eye on. I think that what we're going to see is as um, L2s get even more sophisticated and also, you know, we'll see how the evolution of L1s like Ethereum goes as well, we're going to be able to see much more, much much larger video, um, able to be uploaded onto the onto the blockchain in a, in a sustainable way, um, which I think is going to open up a ton of possibility there. Like right now, to do like a live stream, like to do an entire live stream video on Ethereum straight up would be quite a costly endeavor. Doesn't mean it couldn't be done, but um, but I think that like what we're starting to see is like the viability of short form video, um, which is which points to a lot of potential there. Like one thing that I'm really excited about is um, like music video NFTs. If you look at uh, the creator named Latasha, 
uh, who's just an incredible artist in the space. Um, yeah, she deserves a round of applause. Um, I she, she was here. <laughs> <laughs> we love Latasha. Um, but she, she sold a music video on Zora for $60,000 worth of Ethereum, and, uh, which is the amount of, that she would get from a record label deal for a bonus, you know, except she didn't have to give up any ownership. And, you know, so there's clearly a market for the highly produced video and the like. And so the, the live stream uh, specific question specifically isn't one that I've thought that like a, like a ton about, but one that I think is incredibly interesting and I could see it. Um, one thing I would, I would say is, um, you know, we talk a lot about Web3 and we talk a lot about Web2, but what we don't talk a lot about is Web2.5. And I think that the real success that we've seen as, as time has been um, thinking a lot about Web 2.5 and a chair that doesn't swing uh, uh, unexpectedly, right? No, but um, it's thinking a lot about Web 2.5. And what is Web 2.5, right? It's very easy to say things are black and white, either or, but everything is really gray and and, right? So in Web 2, you know, we have unbelievable access to um, creators. We have events like this, right? We have all of these experiences. Um, how do we take that and push it towards Web3? And how do we take Web3 and push it towards Web2? So that way we could get better sort of interactivity. Here's a real way of thinking about this. Um, one is um, we have Time Studios. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but um, we have an incredible team. And it's been led by an individual named Ian Orifice. And um, they did the Kanye West documentary. And you might not have realized, like, Time Studios produced the Kanye West documentary. Now, in our agreement with Netflix, when we sold it to them, we had one day that we were able to feature it um, before it went live on Netflix. And had we been sophisticated enough as an organization at the time, instead of structuring the agreement with movie theaters, like, timepieces would have acted as a ticket to access live streaming over time.com, right? And so flip that around. Like right now, if you have a timepiece, you can go to time.com, connect your digital wallet, and it removes the paywall frictionless. The same thing can go for live streaming, right? And so not everything, and I say this because not everything has to be so on the chain, right? Like you could use the chain for when it's perfect for the chain, right? Like the technology is actually not good enough today at this moment, I would say, to put a whole movie out there. But you could use the chain to gate content. And I think that that like, ticketing mechanism is a very powerful mechanism um, to consider. Uh, right there. Yeah. Hi. Um, I'm Stacey Yael of Visible Women NFT. And I'm a founder of a new emerging project. And I was on a Twitter space last night that makes me think a little bit about our conversation today. And my background, I'm an attorney. I'm not practicing, but been... This is privilege. And this is all privilege, yes. Um, but it's coming up a lot right now about IP. And I think some of the topics we touched upon, you know, especially as we talk about protecting newcomers to the space and then the power behind, like, time and being involved in the space. And, you know, all of the projects and creators and artists are now kind of coming to the place where they have to start thinking about IP or how much they don't know about IP. And in this Twitter space, you know, I started thinking to myself, you know, there's all these conferences. I know we have um, NFT NYC coming, and a lot of it, the emphasis becomes around shilling, you know, and promoting what you're doing and, and sales. And if we want to care about newcomers, I this was what came up on the space, and I'm just sharing it with you. We don't really yet have, it doesn't seem like conferences or opportunities within the space that the larger projects or, I mean, I feel like I just learned so much when I heard about Times Mint and some of the mistakes that you made. And I feel like that's not, like, that sort of hasn't been explored yet in terms of getting some of the thought leaders in the space to be conducting more internal education to help the newcomers in the space and the artists in the space to learn from mistakes and also um, not fall um, in terms of, I love what you said about only invest what you can sort of afford to potentially lose, while also not to be losing all your resources toward legal or accounting or all kinds of issues that artists and founders and creators, they don't have that knowledge base, but yet 
Neither do the lawyers and the accountants and all of the people. So we're sort of like left with this like big vacuum and needing filling of that vacuum. And I'd just love to hear some of your thoughts on that. Sure. I mean, before, because I've spoken a lot, like I would actually turn to you all, you know, how do you feel about your, like what you create and the IP behind your creation because ultimately you're like an oil well, right? Like everything springs from your mind and then you have to decide how you want to treat that property. Uh, right, that's a great question. Um, I operate as a fine artist, as an artist. And uh, historically, artists always own their IP and they still do in this space or beyond that didn't change much. Um, but a lot of the projects are, in fact, not run as a fine art establishment. They're run as LLC or sort of organization um, that uh, aim to be commercial in the first place. And that really makes sense to sell IP together with NFT. That what um, did a lot of good for board apes. They were not the best, but they were the first. That's, that's uh, actually opened up a whole lot of opportunities for everybody else. Um, a lot of conversations about IP rights. So that what made Bored Apes what they are today, like open IPs, that everybody could use it for like their wine shop, whatnot, like whatever. I mean, you name it. A lot of people were using their apes early on, right? Um, that's, that's also a great thing, I, I feel like. Um, us as an artist traditionally guard our intellectual property so much that we kind of lose sight of... Um, I know greater opportunities is always a struggle. I mean, what are you like? Are you gonna go full on commercial or are you gonna protect your IP? It's it's always uh, there is no right questions here, right? Um, in terms of educating people, um, it, it's not our responsibility. It's like to babysit people. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like it's I ours, nobody it's told. Ours, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. You guys, you guys. We got this for you. Right, 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 right. <laughs> But um, everybody's very open. If you ask questions, people will answer, right? But nobody will go out of their way. Be like, oh, my God, I need you in the space. Like, let me educate you. That'd be weird, right? Huh? You don't want that. Whoever wants to do that, like, you, you wouldn't trust those people, right? Like, you've been to real estate seminars and timeshares, right? Okay, like, that that's not the route we're going to go to, like, huh? If you want to learn, just learn yourself. There are tons of videos that just YouTube it, like, I don't know, NFT now have, like, good resources. Just, like, go type it. In. It's, like, so easy, really. I learn everything myself when there is no information. And it's doable. If I could do it, everybody can do it. It just takes a lot of time. Right? Everything takes time. I mean, that's what it is. If you want to educate it, do it yourself. That's the best way. And if you have questions after you did your own research, just approach people. Like They'll be like, very supportive and open. They'll answer those questions. But yeah, that's. I don't think it's... it's uh, nobody but, but would, I don't know. Don't trust people who go like, beyond educating someone. It's just, no. Don't do that. <laughs> Do we have time for one more? One more? Perfect. Um, in front there. Hi, my name is Farah Fisher. Thank you so much for the awesome presentation. Super nice to informally meet you. Um, I am currently developing a collection of NFTs that's focused on bringing uh, physical and mental health uh, into Web3 and into the space because I think physical and mental health has been a little um, lacking of care. Um, and so I was just wondering, you know, where you think the future of this is going as far as mental health in this space and, you know, physical well being? I, I can speak to this a little bit, you know. Um, you know I, I come from the dance music world uh, where we've lost some really prominent uh, artists, um, such as Avicii, um, due to mental health issues. And uh, watched and saw that all ha firsthand, and the NFT space is like a uh, public health problem, well, health health problem like waiting to happen in a sense, because the space is always on. Uh, it, it can be incredibly emotional with life-changing money and, and, and things at play. And, um, you know, things can so often happen in the middle of the night, like people feel like they can't tear themselves away from the computer. Um, there's, there's, it's just like the perfect storm for, I think, like a bit of a mental health crisis. And so I, I think it's actually like incredibly important um, to, uh, you know, 
uh, remove the stigma, first off, for, of speaking about it. Um, create spaces where people can and, and provide resources to help people and like support the right resources and the right and the right actors who are working to create a better situation. And so I'd be really curious to hear more about your project. Um, yeah. After this. I'll, yeah, I'll chime in too, just to, to build on that too, because I, I think as we've been speaking to community is at the foundation of this movement. And I think we also need to be very intentional and, and remind ourselves that there's no better way to build community than doing what we're doing right now. So even though these are digital assets, a lot of the most meaningful utility still does tie back to IRL connection. I think mental health problems will emerge more the more that people are staring at their screens and not actually connecting with other human beings. So um, let's not neglect that and let's keep that at the forefront of the utility that we're creating. So as a neurotic Jew from New York City, um, I will say that, uh, you know, like I look at weather patterns, right? Like uh, when I think about evolutions, right? And this was a very easy weather pattern to see, right? It's a shift towards uh, online ownership from online rentership. It's a shift in privacy. It's a generational shift and it's a technological shift all converging at once, um, which is why it's big, which is why I wanted to jump into it. Um, uh, during these moments of like tectonic change, like you see extremism take place, right? Um, uh, but the reality is, is that you know, like while shifts then readjust the you know the trajectory of things, um, they do um, adjust back to the mean plus or minus one or two, right? Um, all the time. And so I think for you, like my advice would be look at the trends in society. Like, the trends in society are towards mental health. Like, they're positively blowing in that direction. Um, the trends in society are towards physical health. Like, they are moving in that direction, right? If you look at, like, 1,400 Renaissance paintings, they weren't towards physical health, right? Like, that's not where it was. The trend is definitely in that sort of health space. But, like, the best advice I, I received when I came to time was, here's a 99-year-old brand, right? Think about everything that happened over the course of 99 years. There were wars, there were atomic bombs, there was uh, extreme genocides that took place, there was economic expansions, there was technological changes, there was all these things. And the thing you wanna look at as you build your community is, is like what's actually gonna stay consistent and like what, like why was time, this is what I asked myself, like what made time great over 99 years? Like, and so for you as you launch, you have to say, okay, well, there's so many things that are extreme or wrong with this moment right now. Where are the, where's the tailwinds going? And make sure that you are in that trajectory, but that you're not so far off of where the mean is, plus or minus a few. Well, on that note, please give it up for our panelists. This has been incredible.